We welcome you this morning. We know that uh, you have been blessed by these uh, meetings with Lee Vinden, and so we're delighted to have you back in here again this morning as uh, we continue on in that series. But I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me for just a moment of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you once again, Lord, for the opportunity to study the Bible together. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be here and that the blessings of heaven will be felt. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I would say he hit the ground running. Boy, it's whew, whew. Well, good morning. So by way of announcement before I begin, um, my wife wanted me to let you know, those of you who actually ordered books yesterday and wrote your names down, they're all, they're all packaged and shipped, today, shipped out today, so uh, hopefully they'll be there early next week, I don't know. Uh, they're already, already in the mail. I put the two clipboards over there one more time in case after the meeting, if anybody still wants to get um, one of these books, she will get those in the mail today, um, even if I get the... Uh, signatures and whatever over there early later today we'll get it out today but it's coming all the way from Walla Walla Washington so yeah the, the, the west coast <clears throat> yeah okay I'd like to have one more prayer as we begin or go further so if you just join me Lord Jesus this morning we're going to be paying particular attention to your father you told us that you and the Father were one. You told us that if we'd seen you, we'd seen the Father. And just now, in a very particular and focused way, I'd like to ask that the Holy Spirit would give us such a glimpse of the Father that our hearts are stirred and filled with even more appreciation and love for him, for all three of you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So Holy Spirit, please move among us, not just among us, in us, give us spiritual eyeglasses and spiritual hearing aids. And please also rebuke Satan's power to get in the way in any way, shape, or form. That's my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning I'm reading from the one book I still have with me. Um, and I'm going to be reading from John chapter 8. I just gave you the idea that we're going to take an extra close look at the Father. And um, just interestingly enough, this morning I took my computer Bible and I punched in the phrase Father. And then I asked my computer to show me all of the instances in the gospel of John alone just the gospel of John alone where the word father is used where Jesus uses that word I didn't have any idea there's like 175 or 200 places that Jesus mentions the father in John in the gospel of John and it inspired me I want to come up with a new sermon I wrote myself a note uh, come up with a sermon and call it Father's Day and just just focus on the Father of Jesus and all of his references to the Father, Father's Day. So that's something I'm going to do later, but I made note of it this morning. Anyway, I'm going to read to you from John chapter 8 <clears throat> in a place where Jesus refers to the Father. Um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to see if I should give you a quick preface before I get to the part about the Father, but I think I'm just going to plunge right in. Jesus is responding to some church leaders who are trying to pin him down. And he says, I don't judge, but if I did, my judgment would be right. Because the Father's with me, 
though he's hid from earthly sight. Your laws say if two agree, their witness must be true. With my words I've testified, my father's spoken too. Where's your father, they replied. We've never seen him here. Jesus answered, nonetheless, beside me, he is near. If you really knew the truth of my identity, then my father you'd know too, because he's just like me. We've noted earlier that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was crushed to the point of dying by the weight and guilt of the sins of the world. We also noted already that the thing that was killing him was the sense of separation from his father. And we noted that in order for him to actually die the second death, which is the death that he must die if he's going to take the place for sinners, then he would have to have no sense of his father's presence because the second death is the hopeless and permanent separation from God, eternal. So in Gethsemane, Jesus was taking on sin for us and he was dying before he ever got to Calvary. God sent Gabriel by way of quick review. Gabriel put Jesus on life support, cleaned him up a little from the bloody sweat and sent him on to continue the mission that he'd come here for. So, in the garden, Jesus took sin on. Now he goes to the cross, and the cross settles some bigger business than simply saving you and me. I mentioned a moment ago that in the garden, Jesus took sin on. At the cross, Jesus took Satan on. Now, you might say, well, sin and Satan seem like they're pretty much the same thing. Well, sin is separation from God, and the wages of sin is death. That's what Jesus took on in the garden. But Satan is a real entity and was the covering cherub, highest in heaven, next only to Jesus. He was just a notch below the Trinity, the highest created life form in the universe. And he went bad. And he's been going bad ever since. And it's at the cross that Jesus takes Satan on. Satan had said, as Lucifer, he had said to the angels in the unfallen worlds, he had said that if you really knew what God was like, you would understand that he's all about power and control. That's what Lucifer said. And that we don't have freedom. And that if we're ever going to have freedom, we're going to have to step out from under his power and control. Now, Satan is trying to prove his point. And he believes that if he can squeeze God hard enough, the power and control will leak out. And people will see what was really inside. That's what he's all about. He's basically, he's been saying, what you think you see as God, that's just a veneer. That's just a 
That's just a disguise. That's just a cover. That's just the garment. But on the inside of that, there is power and control. He's a power monger. He's an egomaniac. He wants you to worship him and adore him. He lives for himself and himself alone. And anybody that gets in his way, he crushes. That's what Lucifer is saying. So he's going to try and squeeze God hard enough for power and control to come out. And when you look at what happens from Gethsemane to Calvary and to the point of where Jesus says it is finished, you're seeing Lucifer, you're seeing Satan squeezing God, squeezing God. Because he wants power and control. He wants Jesus to say, I'm done. He wants Jesus to destroy his enemies. Do you remember Abraham Lincoln? After the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln set about to try to rebuild the United States. And his cabinet officers were angry with him because they said, you keep making friends of your enemies. They said, you have won. Now why don't you destroy your enemies? And Lincoln's response was classic. He said, when I make them my friends, have I not destroyed my enemies? So Jesus is coming, and, and Satan is wanting people to think that God is really going to destroy people who don't get along with him, people who don't go his way. He just crushes them. He just uses power and control. Lincoln, use your power and control. Destroy your enemies. Satan says, that's what God's all about. And he's going to try and get Jesus to finally just say, enough of this. You remember when they stood at the foot of the cross? Said, come down, we'll believe. Come down. You say you're the son of God? Come down. Show a little power. Flash a little power. And we'll believe. Satan's trying to get him to show power and control. And he squeezes Jesus. But the only thing that came out the harder he squeezed, the more love came out. He's wringing the sponge of the deity. And the more tightly he wrings it, the more love comes out. God is love to the core. And at Calvary, the Trinity was fully exposing themselves to the core, to the core. At Calvary, God and Satan came head to head. And both sides bet the house. It was all or nothing. They both went for broke. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow at our last presentation. How they both went for broke. And Calvary was Satan's greatest defeat. That's the greatest defeat Satan has ever had. He was exposed for what he is. His veneer was taken off. His mask was removed. And he was exposed for who he really was, and it was his greatest defeat. Desire of Ages, page 758, says, Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels and the unfallen worlds. Not until the death of Christ. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion until Calvary. So when they saw how far Satan would go at Calvary to wring the last drop of love out of Jesus, the unfallen world said, so that's what he's like. That's what Satan's like. No more deception. He stepped fully out into the open. 
All right, so far in this series, we focus primarily on Jesus. But as I've already referred to, he had a father. He had a father, and he refers to that father over and over and over again. He had a father who was watching from a distance. Desire of Ages, page 49, says, The heart of the human father yearns over his son or daughter. The human father looks into the face of his little child. And he trembles at the thought of life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power. He longs to hold his child back from temptation and conflict. But to meet a more bitter conflict and a more fearful risk... God gave his only begotten son. Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. John 3.16, probably one of the most memorized and quoted passages in the scriptures, and yet, do we really fully grasp the impact of what John 3.16 is saying. For God so loved the world. We feel like we understand some of the love of Jesus as we see his life. This starts by saying, for God so loved the world that he gave gave his only begotten son. He did this, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave him to planet earth. God gave him to the human race. And it wasn't a safe neighborhood for Jesus to enter. Picture the father watching. Jesus hits the ground running. No sooner is he born than they're out to kill him. He's just a baby. His eyes have just barely opened. He's just about as helpless and fragile as it can possibly be for a human being. Here he is and already Satan is trying to kill him. And he inspires Herod and others. It's not a safe neighborhood and God's watching from a distance. It is very hard to be separated from our children. It's even harder to be separated from our children if we are understanding that they're being given a hard time where they are. And when we hear about them being given a hard time and we're not there, it breaks our hearts. Hard to be separated from our children. I remember the first time, Margie and I, um, our children never stayed with anybody else overnight until they were probably about nine and ten years old. Our son and daughter about 15 months apart. Um, We never lived close to our relatives. We were always a thousand miles or more away from grandparents and relatives. And we just didn't choose to let our kids go to other places and homes and houses and stay overnight. I have nothing against those who let their children do but we just never did and so when our children were nine and ten years old the other children at the school were all excitedly talking about going to Glacier View Ranch summer camp in Colorado and our children asked if they could go to Glacier View Ranch summer camp in Colorado and we thought you know I guess we better let them grow up and so 
we made arrangements for them to go to Glacier View Ranch. Going to spend a week at summer camp. We thought, well, here we are, eight and nine years old, nine or ten years old, whatever it was, somewhere right around there. We've never been without them. Let's have a little kind of anniversary celebration. So we thought, we, while they're there at Glacier View Ranch, we will take, we will go to a campground by a lake that's about a two hour drive past Glacier View Ranch in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And we will just, just celebrate uh, first time in our married life since children to just be the two of us. So we dropped our children off at Glacier View Ranch, hugged them, kissed them, met their counselors, went back and got in our car, drove off to have our time alone together. Well, when we got to the campground and pitched the tent, had a little, small, little sailboat that would fit on the roof of a car, got that down and put that in the water right beside our campsite. And then we sit in our camp chairs and we look at each other and Margie says, no offense, but I miss the children. I said, no offense taken, I miss them too. So you know what we did the next morning after we got up? Instead of going out on the lake or sitting around the camp, we got back in our car and we drove the two hours back to Glacier View Ranch. We weren't gonna let our children know that we were there. We just wanted to see them. Well, when we got there, they were having some sort of a meeting that was going on inside of a building, but that building had a balcony. So Marge and I went into that building, climbed under the balcony, crawled down to the front edge of the balcony and peered over the top at our children. <laughs> Didn't even tell them that we were there. We just watched them. Oh, there they are. There's Lindsay. There's Chris. And before the meeting was over, we slipped back into our car and drove two hours back to our campsite. It's hard to be away from your children. As I said, it's even harder to watch them if they're going through difficulty, hard times. Another illustration has to do with my daughter, Lindsay, our daughter, Lindsay. Um, when she was about eight years old, she got strep throat. And it was so bad, it was so bad that uh, we took her to the doctor. She was just in terrible pain. And the doctor looked in her mouth, had her say, aw, oh, whatnot, and looked at that little flashlight. And then he said to me, I was, I was with her, Margie was, had to be at work. So I took Lindsay to the doctor. And he says to me, come over here, I want you to look inside your daughter's mouth. He says, look at her throat. Her throat was so raw that there was blood oozing from the lining of the throat. It was like an open wound. You could see it bleeding. He said, this girl's in a lot of, a lot of pain. Then he said to Lindsay, she's eight years old. He said to Lindsay, he said, honey, we're gonna fix what's wrong, but we're gonna have to do it one of two ways. Now he said, we have some pills. They were probably antibiotics, penicillin, something of that sort, I don't remember. But he says, we have some pills that we can give you. They're gonna be hard for you to swallow because your throat is so raw. But if you can get those pills down, in about two or three days, you'll start to feel better. And in about 10 days, you'll be fine. Now he says, there's another way we can treat this. He says, I could give you a shot. If I give you the shot, you'll start feeling better later today. But he said, honey, I want to tell you about the shot. It is not a nice shot. He said, this shot not only hurts going in, it hurts afterwards. 
You're going to be so sore. And he says, I have, to put the in, I have to put the liquid that's in the syringe, I have to put it in slowly. And so it's just going to feel like a sledgehammer pounding on your hip as it goes in. And then it's going to just hurt like the dickens. But he said it'll start helping you feel better sooner. He says, let me show you what the shot looks like. And he brings out a syringe that looks like it was meant for a horse, you know. You know, the needle was the size of a straw at McDonald's, you know. <laughs> at least that's what it looked like to me. He said, Lindsay, what, what do you want? Pills or the shot? I said, Lindsay, take the pills. Take the pills. Lindsay said, you said I'd feel better sooner if I took the shot? I, he said, yes, but it's going to hurt a lot. She said, I want the shot. I said, no, Lindsay, you don't want the shot. She says, no, I want the shot, Dad. I said, Lindsay, your dad can't take you getting the shot. <laughs> she said, I want the shot. All her life, she's always chosen the harder choice. If there's a choice between an easier and a harder way, she always chooses the harder way. She said, I want the shot. So the doctor said, okay, honey, he says, I'm going to ask you to just sort of bend over to the little table here. We're going to pull the back of your pants down a little bit, and we're going to give you the shot right here. He says, you can hold your daddy's hand while we do this. Oh, my word. He starts in that shot. He starts giving her the shot, and I start crying. And Lindsay asks me why I'm squeezing her hand so hard. It just tore me up to watch her suffer as the shot was being administered. It's hard to watch our children in difficult places and suffering. It's hard to watch. My father was once teaching in a classroom full of university students and he was talking about the love of God and a student in the classroom said, well, if God loved us so much, why didn't he just come himself? Why did he send Jesus? And another student in the classroom who was married and had children said, it's obvious you've never had children. If you had, you wouldn't ask a question like that. He went on to say, it would have been the easier thing for God to do to come himself. The easier thing. For God so loved the world. So now remember, Jesus is taking the second death as our substitute. And once again, Sin is separation from God, and the second death is eternal separation from God. So in order for that substitutionary death to happen, God the Father has to go into the other room. So it'd be like me, this is not even close, but just in a very simplistic way, it would be like me when the doctor says, now you can hold your daughter's hand as we give her the shot. And I say, no, I'm just going to go out and get an ice cream. You go ahead and give her the shot. Let me know when it's over. You know, that, I couldn't do that. But God is actually having to pull back. He's having to go into the next room. He's having to shut the door. He's having, to put the air, he's having to put his cell phone in airplane mode. No communication. Separation. And it has to feel to Jesus like it's complete, it's absolute, and it's going to be eternal. So now think about that from a parent's perspective. Think about doing that to your child. Father deliberately and intentionally pulls back and is helpless 
to do anything about his son's suffering. Because of the plan they've agreed on, he's helpless. And it's even harder because he knows he's not helpless. He could fix this. He could stop this. He could interrupt this. He could say, you know what? I, I went along with the idea when it was on the whiteboard in the conference room, but I'm not going on with it now. Come home. He could have done that. He knew he had the power to do that. And when they said to Jesus on the cross, come down and we'll believe who you, you know, believe you. Jesus had the power to come down. Jesus had the power by a blink or a nod to completely nuke everybody around him. God didn't have to let this happen. But because of the agreed on plan that they were working for the salvation of the human race, he steps back heart breaking steps back the closest I think I will ever come to having just a little bit of an understanding of what he felt like was when the Paradise California fire took place Margie and I were eating in a restaurant in Arizona our daughter, Lindsay, is a nurse, and she was working at a hospital in Paradise, California. Paradise, California is up on a mountain, and there's only one lane of traffic going up and only one lane of traffic coming down from Paradise. There's no other roads. One entrance, one exit. And they're separate roads. They're, they're kind of like, you know, how freeways can have a center meridian. So there's a going up lane and there's a coming down lane and there's just land and earth and trees between the two lanes. So we're in the restaurant and we get a phone call. It comes to me. Caller ID says, Lindsay, that's my daughter, our daughter. So I say, hi, Lindsay. She is in hysterics on the phone. She says, Daddy, I am surrounded by flames. She's in her car for two and a half hours. She's been in gridlock. Her car has only moved four city blocks in two and a half hours. I see there's someone down here that's from the Paradise Fire as well. In two and a half hours, she'd only moved four city blocks. And she's calling me and she's saying, Dad, everywhere I look, all I see is flames. Every house that's within view of me as I sit in this car is on fire. Every house. She says they have propane tanks instead of natural gas coming in underground. I'm watching Tanks blow and houses look as though they've been bombed, exploding into nothing. It's happening all around me. She said, burning branches from trees are falling out of the sky and landing on my car. She said, power lines have burned to the ground and the, and the, the, the power line themselves, the telephone the poles, the power poles have burned and the power lines are arcing across the road like a water hose does and it has full power. She says, black smoke is so thick that I can barely see the front end of the car directly in front of me. That's how dark it is. She said, the trees that are all around my car on each side of the road have, have flames that are probably 75 feet up above the tops of the trees. And that's where she is. And she's trapped and she can't go and she's hysterically crying. I, I left the, the restaurant. I went out into the parking lot. And I'm thinking, my daughter's going to burn to death in the next few minutes and I can't do a thing about it I think what do I tell her what do you tell somebody who's trapped what do you tell them 
Uh, get out. No, you don't tell them get out. You stay in your car. Well, what's that going to do? Gasoline in the car is going to blow. I'm trying to think of what to say. I, I can't say anything. And she's crying. And I'm just listening to her. And all of a sudden, she screams, and her phone goes dead. And I'm thinking, that's it. My daughter is burning to death right now. And I am a 1,000 miles away. I got down on my knees in the parking lot of that restaurant, and I started calling out loud to God. And I was saying, do you remember the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace? Do you remember that they were, they were preserved? Will you preserve Lindsay? Will you preserve Lindsay? I felt like a blubbering idiot. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to think. All I could think was my daughter is burning to death right now. You know, there's a lot of ways that I could imagine dying that would be more attractive to me than burning to death. I think that's probably one of the most horrible ways I can imagine dying. Twenty minutes go by. I'm on the asphalt on my knees begging God to preserve Lindsay. And suddenly my phone rings and it has caller ID, it's Lindsay. I say, Lindsay. She says, Dad, the phone went dead because the cell tower fell over. It burned to the ground. She said, somebody in a bulldozer started pushing stalled cars out of the lineup in front of us. And she said, I'm moving now. She said, I had to drive through flames. I had to drive through flames to get to the other side but I am on my way down the mountain and I think I'm going to be okay. Amen. And I thought, so this is how Martha and Mary felt when they saw Lazarus come out of the tomb. And then I thought, God so loved the world that he stepped back helpless and his son burned. His son burned to death. His son went to hell. There's an author who wrote a book called The Cross Was Hell. And that's a good title. Heartbroken. The father watched as his son steadfastly put one foot in front of the other, plodding towards Jerusalem and crucifixion. The father watched. He watched. From Gethsemane to Calvary, picture the father with me, pacing back and forth somewhere on a veranda or deck that just is off from the throne room. Try to picture. He's left the throne. He's gone through the double doors. He's out on the deck. And he's standing at the edge of the deck where the fence is going around, the railings that goes around the deck. He's got his hands on the wall. They're actually rock walls. And, and I'm just trying to picture this. And, and, and he's looking down. And he's looking down with the kind of vision that God has. And he's watching Gethsemane. And he's watching as Jesus moves from Gethsemane 
to Calvary. Picture him there. If you could stand to the side with some of the angels watching him, he's oblivious to everyone and everything. He is absorbed by what he's watching. He is there with his son, even though his son doesn't know it. His father is there. And as you look at the father standing there watching the son, you can see his jaw muscles clenching and unclenching. You can see the temples bulging. You can see the veins uh, throbbing as the blood pressure rises as he watches his son. He grips the marble retaining wall. He's oblivious to all the angels who are watching. He steps back. He, he walks to one side. He walks to the other. He comes back and looks again. He, he turns away. He, he looks again. He, he turns away. He looks again. Picture him. See his eyes wincing. See his jaws clenching. See his grip on the retaining wall getting firmer and firmer. See the tears pouring like rivers from his eyes as he watches them torture his son. As he watches them flogging his son. As he watches the flesh being torn from the back of his son. Watch him as he sees them spitting on his son, as he sees them cursing and ridiculing and laughing at his son. See him as he watches them drive the nails through the tender flesh. See him as they lift the cross the body weight of Jesus causing the wounds that the nails have created to gape wider as his weight pulls against the openings. The father watches. He sees every nerve in his son screaming with agony because the nails are strategically placed to pinch the nerves and create even more pain. Watch the father watching as they let go of the cross and drop it into its deeply dug socket. <laughs> Watch the father as he sees the disciples flee. Watch the father as he sees the women hanging back. Watch the father as he observes everyone forsaking his son and realizing that he also is part of the crowd that's pulled back. Watch the father listening to the wagging tongues and the mocking voices. And then, and then the son cries with a tortured voice that rips through the universe, blasting against the walls of heaven. And the words he cries are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those words come slamming into the wall that the Father is looking over. Suddenly the wall under the Father's hand crumbles into dust. <laughs> He leaps over the rubble. He parts the universe. He launches and lands beside the cross. And as he lands, the earth shakes and tombs open. He reaches up and turns off the sun. Darkness envelops the planet. Darkness envelops the cross, a black hole. Lightning flashes. The earth is trembling and quaking under his weight. The planet is shivering to atoms. Jesus is not permitted to know who is there. The Father himself is screaming with anguish. And he is crying 
profuse tears. And there's nobody to wipe the tears from the Father's eyes because he's the one who has the job of wiping away all tears. Jesus gasping hoarsely for breath, his chest heaving, summons some strength from somewhere down there in that deep, great, courageous heart of his. He flexes his cramped muscles. He pulls himself as erect as possible in order to have enough air in his diaphragm to speak what he's going to speak next. And suddenly in a voice that pierces eternity, Jesus shouts, It is finished. And in that instant, if you read the Desire of Ages account on this, something wonderful happens. In that instant, when Jesus said, it is finished, Jesus has now gone all the way to hell. He has drank or drunk the cup of sin and guilt to the last drop. He has completed the mission. Mission accomplished. And he cries out, it is finished. And in that brief instant before his head drops in death, after he has shouted, it is finished, in that brief instant, the father's strong arms wrap around him in a Herculean, Herculean hug. Desire of Ages says, a brilliant light encircles the sun on the cross. Amen. And what does he say next? He's already said it is finished. You know what he says next? He says, Father! <laughs> Father's weeping, but he's holding him. And he says, Father! Father! You're here! Into your hands, I commit my spirit. And just before he bows his head in death, the father whispers, well done, good and faithful servant. I'll see you Sunday morning. First John 3, Verse 1 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Listen to Buddy sing about that. He could have said they're just not worth the time it takes to save. But his love was so much deeper than we had ever seen. When he said he's our father and we're his family. What love, what love the father has for us. That we should be his children. I gotta say what love, what love the Father has for us Somehow we could be His family Creator of the universe, ruler of it all Still I'm absolutely sure He's got our picture on his wall And we're gonna live forever With this genealogy Cause the Father through Christ Jesus Made the cross our family tree What love, what love the Father has 
for us We should be his children I gotta say what love, what love the Father has for us If somehow we could be his family He could have left us to die here what love? But he wanted it so near what that he gave it all So he could call us home Oh, what love, what love the Father has for us That we should be his children I gotta say what love, what love the Father has for us Somehow we could be his family Somehow we could be his family Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We are remembering the words of Jesus to his followers when he said, I ascend to my Father and your Father. Wow. We remember the words of Jesus when he said that we have been adopted into the family of God. We remember the words of Jesus as he looked around the crowd and said, These are my brothers my sisters, my mother. It's an amazing thing to consider that we are sons and daughters of yours. Uh, princes and princesses in the family of God, the royal family. Uh, brothers and sisters to the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing, amazing thing it is. And, and Heavenly Father, I, you know, from my earthly perspective as a parent, when I think about Lindsay up there in paradise fire, I just can't imagine how you pulled that off, how you, how you were able to give your son to the human race and watch as he completes the plan of salvation for us. I, uh, we thank you, Jesus, for, for coming. We thank you for your incarnation. We thank you for spending 33 and a half years among us. We thank you for retaining human form even now on the throne beside the Father. But Father God, we thank you for what you went through so this could happen. We don't think about it enough. We sort of fixate on the cross and on Jesus, and that's good. I know that you don't mind us doing that, but what a gift you gave when you gave us your only begotten son. What a gift you gave. You too are worthy of praise and honor and glory and blessing throughout eternity. And we can't wait to thank you in person. We'll throw crowns at your feet also. And for all eternity, we will wonder and marvel at your amazing love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.